Um, so without any uh, further preamble from myself, um, let me just introduce the participants in this roundtable discussion on graffiti and street art, a queer feminist approach. Um, Mirto Silvunidi, uh, with whom we co-edited the special issue. Myself, Ana Karasathi. Um, Yulia Tulke, uh, who's joining us from the US at the moment, University of Rochester. Hi, everyone. Hi, Yulia. Oksana Zaporozhets, um, who's joining us from Germany, Leibniz Institute for Institute, uh, excuse me, Leibniz Institute for Regional Geography. Hi, Oksana. <laughs> <laughs> um, Susan Hansen, joining from the UK, uh, Middlesex University. Hey, Susan. Okay. Keep an eye for people waving. Um, Pariti Gupta uh, from Jawaharlal Nehru University in India, in Delhi. Hi. Hello, everyone. Hi, hi. Um, Sarah Awad from Alborg University in Denmark. Hello. And Kostadinos Agramidis from the University of Cyprus joining us actually from the right to my left here in Athens Hello. at the moment. Hello. So Mirto would like to say a few words about sort of what motivated us to do this special feature, Scenes and Sounds in City Journal. Yeah. I um, hand it over to you. We had prepared like a, a small introduction. Uh, we never did it because we had this issue with the black screen. So we would you would follow the, the sound of the spray tank. And in a way, you know, um, me and Costas, we, we always want to say that sometimes academic writing or scholarship and graffiti are not so distinct um, in the sense that, you know, this attention to the words, to the detail, to the placing uh, is, is also happening to some really nice scholarship. So we always remind ourselves that these are not two distinct things. Um, so this, this special issue happened at the moment where the, the word crisis was, uh, was all over. And in, in reaction to, to the different crises in the different locations, there were always inscriptions on the walls. And we started following these inscriptions. So the different contributions, they gave us glimpses or certain urban environments. Of course, Julia and Costadinos uh, talk about the saturated walls here in Athens after a decade of financial crisis and then six years of what Europe calls a refugee crisis. And then uh, Oksana and Natalia, they talk about the crisis of self-expression and representation in public space in Moscow. Um, then Susan talks about the counter responses, the visual counter responses to the same sex marriage in Australia. Um, Paridi is taking us to Delhi and the ongoing struggle for girls and women, women's presence in public space by the beautiful art of, artwork of Srizata. Hello, Srizata. Um, Piera is talking about Hong Kong and the crisis of eviction and gentrification um, under the military government. Uh, Hello. I forgot to introduce dear Pujarat. I'm really sorry uh, joining us from Thailand at the moment. Apologies. And our final stop is Egypt uh, with the Tahrirske Square with uh, Sarah's paper and the transformation of the walls uh, there. Um, so I think, in other words, we view like city walls more like a canvas and the social conditions in the different locations um, as the paint in a gallery of mainly untold stories. So what I wanna to celebrate today is that what started and it's still a very much masculine and much oriented culture um, has now seen a transformation there as well. So, 
there is a strong element, not only in the scholarship of British colonialist perspectives, but also of different crews um, and different writings on the walls. And that is something to be celebrated. Um, also, what, what I think combines the, pap the papers together, other than that, is an interest, not, not in defining what street art is, per se, like what counts as street art or not, but what it does. Um, so I think this is, this is also important. Um, so a decade after Kurt Iverson's uh, special issue in City, we can celebrate uh, the queer feminist special issue. And with that, let's start the questions. Yeah, definitely. Um... I just wanted um, to thank also everybody at City um, on behalf of all of us for their support um, in getting the special feature through a number of um, stages and steps um, and presenting the visual essays therein in such a beautiful form and also helping us organize this event. Um, and it's, um, yeah, let's get right into the, the let's say, the, the thick of it. <laughs> um, we have some images also to show you at some point, and maybe actually I will share my screen right now. Um, so you get a little bit of a taste of what the, uh, special feature looks like. These are visual essays. And although we won't have a kind of formal presentation of all of the essays, we thought we'd structure this more like a discussion amongst all of us. Um, you'll get a little bit of a sense of what, um, what the images that are kind of the, um, say, um, the grounding of the arguments in the various visual essays, what the images look like. So the first um, question that we wanted sort of to address and that we address in broad strokes in the special feature um, has to do with um, the masculinism of graffiti and street art, which you already alluded to, Mirto, um, as a scene, as a practice, as a body of scholarship, it seems to, uh, be pervaded by a kind of masculinist culture. Um, so a question that we are interested in um, is how it might be performed and viewed through a queer feminist lens um, and how the approach that you've taken in your own scholarship on graffiti and street art uh, may embody this queer feminist perspective. So I um, throw it out to you, uh, Susan, for a response on this. Brilliant. Uh, thank you so much, Anna and Mirto, uh, for the invitation to speak and for um, letting me be part of this very cool collection um, of visual scholarship on graffiti and street art from a queer feminist perspective, whether that's articulated explicitly within the papers or not, I really am delighted to be asked to be part of a panel where that's kind of foregrounded rather than something that I feel I'm constantly sneaking in, you know, as some kind of critical alternative, you know, just don't give it a capital F, don't, you know, don't, don't come out too much on stage and maybe they'll listen to you and you will get some respect on the grounds of you know, just kind of fitting in. Anyway, I digress. So yes, uh, seeing that line in uh, Merito and Anna's editorial that said, you know, this collection is tagging a spot for queer feminist contributions to the academic subfield of graffiti and street art made me kind of happy because it's, you know, saying something that we all privately say once we've finished our presentations, but we don't always get together and kind of foreground that. So actually I think question one is the more radical question. Question three, on what do we do now that crisis is ongoing is just making me feel very burnt out at the moment. So I'm really glad that the rest of you have enough energy for that. Um, I think in terms of my approach to, to, to scholarship and looking at the other contributions to this collection, I think one of the things that we do have in common is that we are 
kind of challenging this um, model of scholarship that kind of valorizes the singular artist or author, uh, the singular photograph of a work as it appears on the wall, and which kind of really decontextualizes um, what it is that we're looking at. Yeah, it takes it out of local socio-political context, does not look at what happened next on the wall, um, and is very much based on an art historical model of scholarship that, you know, looks at individual and quite often male artists um, and creates a kind of a myth around that and a mode of analyzing work that's based on, you know, sort of looking at work in galleries where you're not allowed to interact with work now, yeah, but work on the street is ideally um, far more democratic and participatory. And I think a lot of our ways of trying to capture this, capture that contestation over who has the right to express themselves yeah, and some of the, the kind of the debates occurring in public space, which kind of echo, you know, local socio-political and also international um, crises as well. So that kind of reframing and re-embedding of work on the walls in socio-political and also temporal context. I really enjoyed reading Sarah's paper because I think we both kind of have this approach to walls as kind of dialogic, as, as conversational, yeah, that doesn't erase out, um, you know, the tags or the comments on the on the more beautiful pieces, and in fact also looks at the practice of of negative curation or, the, or buffing as part of that conversation, whether that's, you know, a local person taking offence to work and painting it off, or whether that's this kind of zero tolerance approach, or the, the approach that I'll let Sarah talk about because it is her research, <laughs> whether that's a kind of a top down erasure, yeah, so erasure is part of this conversation, yeah, so and I think that that, in essence, as a form of critical scholarship is queer feminist, although I did appreciate, as I said, the opportunity to conjoin my interest in LGBT plus rights, inclusion and scholarship with my graffiti and street art scholarship. This is actually the first paper where I put those two things together. So thank you for the opportunity. That's me done. Thank you for your beautiful paper, uh, Susan, and those remarks. Um, Biarat, what are your insights on this question, I wonder? Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you, um, uh, Sidi. I'd like to thank you, uh, both of you, to uh, contribute to these uh, uh, special features. Uh, it's it's very great opportunity to join this um, these special features and to be in part of these wonderful collections. Uh, what I like to uh, respond for question number one is about a. Uh, um, I think creativity has a long offer and alternative lens for which to live and propose solution to some of the world most pressing issue. In recent years in Thailand, there have been grassroots movements, civil society organizations activists, social workers, teachers, and academics, to name but a few, across the country, working hard to urgently discuss important issues related to the crisis, to the feminist, queer, and decolonized lens. This movement have fairly challenged political homophobia and anti-feminism uh, locally through policy intervention street demonstration and digital activism. In the movement, it also seeks forms of uh, expression and political action that critique structures of uh, sexism, heterosexism and patriarchy and misogyny. As we know, a queer feminist perspective is based on the recognition that gender and sexuality are not only um, central to any understanding of a wider social and political process, but also uh, always brought forth in complex intersections with other social inequalities and conditions. Um, it might be useful to expand uh, to expand upon this per perspective, to analyze power structure to the lens of um, intersection uh, of intersecting social divisions, such as um, racialization, 
gender, sexuality, or cause diversity in current political uh, context. Uh, that's that's uh, that's now for me. Thank you. Thank you, Piarat, for those reflections. Um, Yulia, queer feminist perspective. Yes, gladly. Thank you from my end as well for having me today for the beautiful special issue for the beautiful um, events we had in Leeds. I am very happy to kind of be together again, if not in an embodied way, but in community and celebration of this beautiful special issue that you um, curated and edited. So I really, um, want to say something I suppose a little bit more generally in response to this question which is that I think employing a feminist queer perspective is really about becoming and highlighting space invaders and I say this with reference not to the French street artist Space Invader but a 2004 book that some of you may know uh, by Nirmal Puar um, that's called Space Invaders, Race, Gender, and Bodies Out of Place. And I'll happily post a link in the, in the chat in a moment. So in this book, Puar describes a dialectic between what she calls the somatic norm and the space invader. And I want to actually quote her here, and I will put the quote in the chat that you can follow, so you can follow up on, just because I think it is really insightful with regard to this question. Let me just open up the chat so I can post it for all to see. So she says, social spaces are not blank and open for any body to occupy. While all can in theory enter, it is certain types of bodies that are tacitly designed as being the natural occupants of specific positions. Some bodies are deemed as having the right to belong, while others are marked out as trespassers who are, in accordance with how both spaces and bodies are imagined, circumscribed as being out of place. Not being the somatic norm, they are space invaders. Their arrival brings into clear relief what has been able to pass as the invisible, unmarked, and undeclared social norm. And I really want to refer to this here. I mean, there are echoes here in the in the notion of, of graffiti as something out of place in a more general sense. But I think this figure, this idea of the somatic norm and the space invader are really immensely generative when we think about a feminist queer perspective to street art and graffiti scholarship practice and also teaching because they really help us to center one of the most enduring and I think most frustrating normative ideas about street art and graffiti, which is that the general anonymity of these practices somehow renders embodied identity irrelevant, right? So there's this idea that there is a distance between the body that uh, the body of a writer, the body of an artist, and the trace that they leave on the wall. And by virtue of that, somehow this trace ends up transcending race, class, gender, and so forth, right? So this is, and I mean, I, I don't have to tell you all about this, but I do want to articulate it here because there is in turn this romanticized notion that writing on walls is somehow inherently democratic, that those are somehow inherently the marginal stories. But that's, you know, if we look as all of us have in some way more closely at who actually participates, who benefits, how risk and benefits are differentially distributed among lines of race, class, gender, and so forth within this practice, as they are in any other context, then I think uh, we can really get at a more queer, feminist, embodied understanding of the practice. And so for me, as a visibly queer feminist scholar, educator, photographer, you know, to some extent, I guess, practitioner, I feel like I do take on the position of space invader whether matters of gender are being explicit, explicitly discussed or not. And in my, my piece for the special issue, they're not necessarily explicitly discussed, but I think any encounter I have with the field um, 
is really insightful and it always forecloses certain conversations and enables others. I haven't really thought or written about that in too much of an explicit sense about what my particular body inhabiting this field really forecloses and opens up, but I hope at some point I can, and maybe this can be a starting point in, and I, I hope to kind of reflect on these things in more of a collaborative setting as well in a kind of assembly of space invaders. So I hope that today we can kind of function as an assembly of space invaders and start addressing some of these questions. Okay, thank you for that. Yes, um, let's accept this invitation. Um, so um, for, the, for the second question, which is a little bit to give us context in terms of your papers, um, we're thinking of um, the special issue treats graffiti and street art and urban interventions as inscriptions of crisis in public space. So it, we, the question is, what is the relationship in, in your own case study between crisis and urban inscriptions? And you're going to notice that we deliberately did not have as a case study the US or the UK we tried to avoid you know, hegemonic uh, places of inscriptions. So, Paridi, do you want to start? Thank you, first of all, to both of you for curating this absolutely beautiful, beautiful uh, edition. Thank you to City, to their extremely kind editors who have worked with us for a long time now, in making this possible. And now like coming to the brass tacks of it. Uh, I really want to focus on the kind of crisis. One is quite obvious in my paper about the crisis of gender, but primarily it is about the crisis of not belonging in a space. And to bring in Julia's point, it's about made to feel like you constantly do not belong in some place. And what happens when as artists, you come into that space and take up that space because we often think of graffiti as the end product. We do not think of the process of making it because you're not just inputting. So in my project, it's about uh, these really young adults in a marginalized urban village uh, in the capital of India. And some of them are um, immigrants from uh, war torn countries, from um, marginalized nations from marginalized caste class gender identity and they've sort of found this community uh, with the art group review and as a part of belonging they created these murals but and they created these murals where they've centered women having um, enjoying the public space and this image is so intuitively opposite to what they see around them which is a highly male space occupied by males, traversed by males. But the point is not, it's not just about the image. It's about the entire time that they have spent in creating that image. And they have occupied that space where women are not even seen. Um, women are not even seen. So we really have to think of uh, this not as a resolution of crisis, but how is the crisis addressed? So I want to focus on the, uh, within this question. I want to focus on that addressal of crisis, not the resolution of it in terms of images, in terms of graffiti, but what happens in the process as a feminist, as women, as visibly gendered bodies who enter the space, occupied for a long amount of time with uh, paints, uh, with buckets of paints, with paint brushes, and what is the discomfort that they create around them? What is, um, what is the reaction they get from passersby, and how do they deal with it? and how belongingness that comes as a result of it. So uh, that's what I wanted to focus on within this question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Costa? Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, first of all, thank you uh, for, for the kind of addition of the work that you've put into this special issue. Um, so, yes, you can hear me. Um, well, I mean, um, 
I mean, the relationship might be at least for, for this special issue. Um, the, it, although it relates to, to crisis uh, moments in the periphery of, of, of what we call as a geographical domain in Europe, um, I, I see this opportunity of crisis as a, um, as a form of critique and a critique of the very means of space production, which we often take for granted. Uh, in a sense, it I mean, through my architectural training and background, in a sense, the aim was to undermine the, like the hegemony of spatial production and architectural representation uh, uh, itself. Um, and so this, uh, crisis of representation in the public domain becomes is turned into a critique of the means of representing uh, uh, space and effectively is uh, there is an attempt to bring in to to representation this uh, quite much needed uh, multivocality of uh, what it means to to be present uh, and express yourself in. Uh, in, in, in public space, especially also bringing these voices of different moments or crisis moments uh, together, speaking uh, uh, to each other. So that's the way I, I was seeing the crisis in my piece. And I think in one way or another, it's, it's also talking to, 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 to uh, other, other pieces too, especially to as well. Again, thanks so much for having me and to be this super uh, special uh, issue of uh, city. Thank you. Oksana, do you want to go next? Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mirta and Dana, for this beautiful special issue. And I uh, would like to express my gratitude to dedicating this special issue to the memory of my dear Corsa and friend Natalia Samutina, which was one of the pioneers of studying graffiti in Russia. And today we uh, take this wide geography of graffiti and street art studies the diversity of that as something like taken for granted but it was not uh, like that for many years and i'm re really grateful to have an opportunity to talk about experience of graffiti and street art in russia so and thank you natasha for all our adventures and collaborating um we really miss you. And um, talking about uh, the uh, second question, the connection between um, graffiti and street art and crisis, I would like to uh, say that our assumption was that not uh, only uh, the content of graffiti or street art uh, reflects uh, the crisis, but uh, the uh, fact of the very presence of graffiti street art inscription in the city that actually reflects the crisis. And um, it's like easy uh, to say about that uh, in Moscow now and like several years ago, because the very absence of graffiti or the quick removal or um, buffing uh, graffiti from uh, the streets of Moscow, that was a symptom, that was the sign of crisis. Because uh, talking about like cities uh, now all over the world, we think that like this um, intensive urban imagery, graffiti street art inscriptions. It gives us uh, a normality of uh, urban life because like this um, uh, imagery uh, just um, uh, 
sometimes it becomes iconic for several cities. Sometimes it beco uh, becomes just a part of the normal life. And for many years, uh, it was not like that in Moscow because uh, streets were cleaned, um, street art was erased. And uh, at some point it was like started substituting with uh, commissioned uh, street art uh, promoted by uh, state or promoted by uh, neoliberal agents. And it actually uh, changed the uh, whole picture for us because um, um, urban space became came occupied uh, by this, this, these uh, big agents. And uh, what we are um, talking in our paper is that um, the very presence of uh, small urban inscriptions, like small sized graffiti, small sized imageries, small sized inscriptions uh, is the thing uh, that do matter. And it's the thing that brings uh, public discussions back to the street. And well, it's not good to be a prophet in a very bad sense, but uh, today I can say that uh, Russian anti-war movement and it exists in Russia, so they use these small scale inscriptions or printing uh, on the walls on money or I don't know shop prices tax. So they use these small inscriptions just to uh, present their position or their opposition towards um, the events, towards what is going in our region. So uh, that's uh, the very idea that not the presence, but the absence uh, speak up uh, for crisis and uh, the old idea that the size of imagery matters and small uh, scale becomes the representation of uh, what people uh, think, what people want and what they are eager to discuss and react to the present situation. So thank you one more time for giving us an opportunity to talk about our part of the world, about our cities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sara, you want to go next? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I, I second what many have said. Thanks a lot for creating that space. So speaking of space, we can speak also of academic spaces that are inclusive. Um, that uh, where we are able to have a dialogue, we're able to share ideas, uh, build on each other's ideas. Um, so thanks a lot for creating that space, um, all the authors, but also the editors, um, Anna and Mirto. Um, and also speaking of space in relation to my topic, so my field work and the article um, has been on the case of Egypt. And uh, when I think about um, space and inscription of crisis in the city space, I think of how on a more general level, um, power dynamics, our social relationships, who's represented and who's not represented um, are always spatialized. Um, they are always present in the spaces we live and we consume every day. Um, they become more explicit with a case like in, in the case of Cairo or Egypt, the Egyptian revolution and having certain spaces that have new inscriptions that are writing things that were or, or, um, proclaiming space in a certain way that was not accepted before. And then one would reflect back on the time before that and they would think about how um, power um, has a monopoly over visual representation in the city how for many years, um, it's not only that the only images you see are advertisement images or images of authority, but it's also how the authority is represented. So it's only one version of the authority figure as untouched and as always young and always the father of the nation and, and all that. And then we, we see the counter images of the revolution really breaking away with this and providing another version of it. But as, um, as, um, as in my work and the work of many others, as well as uh, Susan's work, which I built on as well, um, the idea is when we follow those images and inscriptions in the city, and uh, we follow them as uh, some form of a, of a social dialogue and some form of responses uh, to each other, some re-reproducing certain visuals, some refuting them, then um, we find 
how um, power is spatialized and then contested in the space, but also how it's um, taken over again. And in the case of Egypt, we could see it in this um, cycle of um, the protest movement taking over, but also the counter -pro protest um, government um, in forms of erasure and in form of um, uh, inscriptions on the city themselves, like some of the government inscriptions were writing on city walls, the wall is not the place for your opinion. Um, and, and yeah, so we look at that dialogue. So my, my more general point is how much um, um, power dynamics and representations are always spatialized in the places we live in. It's just that sometimes we do not see them and we do not see the the, the not represented. So we don't see the absences of who's not represented in spaces. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Susan? Sorry, now I'm unmuted. Um, okay, this was the crisis question, wasn't it? Yes. Okay, I'm focused. Um, yeah, so the crisis that I looked at in the case study um, that's part of this collection uh, was centred around the Australian um, vote or postal plebiscite, it was like a postal vote, um, voluntary, um, for marriage equality or same-sex marriage in Australia, which uh, depressingly was as recent as 2017, so lagging behind a lot of the rest of the world. Um, I mean, I was interested in this, A, because I'm Australian, <laughs> and because I'm queer and also because I'm interested in, as you all are, what happens um, on the walls of our city as well as in, you know, sort of official forms of, of public debate. Um, but what happened was because there was a like a six week campaign period before the actual vote, the, the rates of um, homophobia and, and hate speech uh, that were reported dramatically escalated yeah so this has been described as an acute external minority stress event for lgbt plus people and their allies in australia at the time um so it was not a great period and this this hate crime also included reports of hate crime um in the form of of graffiti and um other sort of visual works in public space so what i was interested in was not just looking at um homophobic graffiti that was against marriage equality, but I was interested in looking at the level of subversion of and resistance to hate in public space. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it has kind of a happy ending, obviously, this story, but it's quite a, a kind of a grueling thing to engage with because, you know, I mean, this postal vote, this being put on the agenda, one group of people's human rights being put on the agenda as if you you could choose to vote for them to have human rights <laughs> that everybody else has or not really seemed to release um a lot of homophobic public sentiment and the, and the volume of that i think surprised people so what i was interested in is the ways that in this crisis um people responded by playfully subverting <laughs> um some of these hate messages and also by um what I was talking about earlier, so this this kind of negative curation or erasure. So this uh, playful subversion included, these are the campaign billboards of the anti-marriage equality um, groups. And um, you can see that people were kind of interacting with these and subverting these messages. Um, this is the kind of lighter end of the scale. Um, so I kind of documented that using this uh, repeat photography method that Sarah and I share uh, an attachment to sort of looking at what happens to these spaces over time in this ongoing debate. Um, and I was also interested in the inverse of this. So rather than people um, trying to subvert hateful graffiti or hateful messages at um, the Christian right in particular was encouraging people to paint bomb or buff or paint over and erase pro-marriage equality murals um, such as this one. Yeah, so I was interested in tracking that through repeat photography um, to see both the actions of the, of the paint bombers and the, and the evangelistic buffers. And also, as you can see in this third image, in how people responded to the buff. In this case, it's, it's like an invitational democratic surface that kind of reinforces that, you know, 
can't paint over love. I mean, some of this is quite cheesy, but it is a kind of, you know, an affirmation um, of, of rights that was luckily born out in the vote. Uh, so it was based on both um, repeat photography. So the same wall over time, looking at that intense debate and attempts at erasure. And also um, I managed to collect some video recordings of attempted erasures in process and people challenging um, the people painting over or attempting to paint over these murals. So two different data sources, two different ways into the crisis, one kind of over time um, and one in the moment of attempted erasure, which, which I think is a rare source of, of data for us um, that that kind of, you know, what happens when somebody tries to erase something from the public visual landscape that you're quite attached to <laughs> ideologically and how how is that challenged yeah, and how is that resisted so I really in the end enjoyed writing this paper especially as the vote went as it should have done but yeah that it wasn't always fun okay let's move on <laughs> thank you very much Susan um Let's move to the third and final question that we have, which in a way brings into the present um, these visual essays, which you began writing, well, nearly five years ago, really. Um, and of course, a lot has happened since. Um, and since we were dealing with crises that were unfolding at the time of writing, um, and these crises, some of them declared, some of them undeclared, um, are kind of urgent, uh, temporally um, violent often, but seen as temporary conditions. Um, I guess we were wondering how you would reflect on um, the urban conditions unfolding then or just previously. Um, and how your perspective has shifted in the last five years or how these conditions themselves have perhaps shifted in the various contexts in the last five years. Um, so maybe this time we can start with um, Piarat. Thank you. Uh, okay, um, five years ago, uh, I uh, I was in the field work and I accidentally find this this place, the community which I took a photo and then later um, surprisingly for myself, it's become part of this uh, special issue. And it's so sad to share that um, five years later, nothing changed much in Thailand. <laughs> We still under a uh, military uh, led government. And, you know, this kind of government, we can't expect much, right? Um, Thailand is in the midst of trans, uh, formation, transformation itself from a predominantly rural country to an increasing urban one. In as little as 10 years, the country has shifted from 36%. Um, Moment, please. From 36% uh, urban to almost 50% 50 uh, 50 urban, which means that half of the population now lives in the, the cities and urban areas. While Thailand's urbanization rates are still low compared to other developed nations. This transition or uh, this transformation in Thailand is still significant especially as most of the growth occur and is expected to occur in Krung Thep area, better known as Bangkok, a capital city uh, of Thailand. This development will place uh, increasing demands on urban infrastructure as the city grows and grows. The evictions of the community is part of a wider effort to modernize Bangkok Authorities are also clearing the sidewalks of vendors and um, food stores and remove home and shanty along the Chao Priya River to build a promenade. So sorry guys, if you uh, visit Bangkok and looking for uh, our 
uh, street food, it might be more difficult to find one because they want to beautification Bangkok. Um, the, the civic groups say that the eviction mostly target the poor communi communities who have no formal rights over their land or, or property, yet are integral part of the city, contribute to its economy and colorful character. Beautification, uh, beautification is awoke as a justification for urban recognition that threaten existing, existing ways of life and ignore the, uh, the aesthetic values and social needs of the poorer residents. They are being uh, people, uh, they are being sacrificed on the altar of the touristic act experience. It is the tragedy for Bangkok and for Thailand. I would say um, Thai society have become uh, irreparably divided by the interests of the ruling elites, defining the exception, and it is argued comparable to historical and contemporary authoritarian regimes elsewhere. The military-led government's urban develop, develop, development plan aren't just about the economy. The city itself is being weaponized against the poor and their politics. COVID-19 outbreak and related quarant quarantine measures, including subsequent uh, recovery measures and policy response uh, also exacerbate inequality in the city, expand the urban um, poverty and uh, deepen the divine nation and expand the inequality that exists before the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, outbreak. So now, uh, for the ruling elites, there is no time for try. Uh, there, there is no time for high. They are uh, willing anymore to do with the poor and to do uh, everything with the city. Thank you. Thank you, Priyat. Um, <clears throat> Sarah? Yes, um, like uh, Pierrat, uh, I also don't have good news about the transition of the situation. Um, when I did my research, actually, um, when I applied for the whole idea of looking at straight out of the revolution, that was earlier in 2012 or 13, and uh, the idea was to look at that protest movement, uh, the visual production, basically, of the Egyptian social movement. Um, some years forward until the proposal was approved and I got to do my PhD, the situation was that everything was erased. <laughs> and then uh, my thoughts then was, uh, that's actually what guided me into the idea of the social life of images because then it was a situation of not just some images erased, but it was a situation of counter revolution. It was a situation of great loss and grief um, of the activist and the grief of the future that would have been uh, the chance that something could have been different. Um, and having a, a counter movement in the government that in many analysis is, is worse than before the revolution right now. Um, and this question, the idea of what one can do anyway, research wise, that would be meaningful uh, to look at um, visual production of movement, a movement that is cracked down, a movement that many of them are imprisoned or died. Um, and then this led me to the idea of, of looking at uh, the social life of those images. Maybe those images live on and they have other spaces to live on. They are documented in some way. They have uh, deconstructed and reconstructed certain images about the nation, about the people. Um, and then, so the, the situation, um, as I say, is, is not that um, positive. Uh, but about the transition of my perspective, um, even in the time of the PhD, looking at the traveling of those images from the street space to um, from being murals to only being able to be quick stencils for um, the idea of uh, the risk of being in public space and the risk of using public space for political messages, 
to then traveling into the online space. Um, one further transition I would say now that's different than um, five years ago is that even the online space is quite threatening right now. Um, so images that are making fun of um, El Sisi as a president or posts or um, are uh, targeted or um, people posting things, um, mobile phones are checked randomly in the street. Um, so this leaves me a, a bit pessimistic, of course, about the situation today and that um, um, I do think um, those ideas still live on. They still live on in, in more hidden cultures and hidden spaces now, um, like hidden transcripts, if I use the idea of uh, James Scott, I think is the name. Um, but it's uh, getting less and less space, and I think it's it's waiting for um, a further moment where there would be a space for expression. Um, another thing also about the, the idea of doing images or art as a form of social action and political action um, comes also not only for me, but also for participants, uh, street artists that I have talked with. Um, it becomes also a matter of um, thinking the value and the potential it could come with, but also the risk on people's own personal lives and families. Um, the risk is not even on the own person. It, it extends to their family and harm extends beyond the person. So it's, it's a very tough situation to have an optimistic thing to say. Um, but uh, something that caught my attention with the Pirat um, discussion of the situation in Thailand is also that idea that, um, of course, the, the city space is more renovated now. It's very much controlled and renovated and, and fresh white paint uh, everywhere and way more cameras. So we can see, again, power very much spatialized in the space. Um, and, and to some who support this move, um, developments, uh, see it as beautification, see it as we're finally moving away from the chaos of the revolution, right? Um, but I, I would end with one participant who uh, labeled those kinds of beautif beautifications and renovations all around the city and especially in the central areas of the protest like the Hill Square, uh, calling it, this is a cover-up rather than a beautification or innovation. It's like when you do a crime and you need to cover up and push things under the carpet. Um, so I'm, my, my academic attention is getting more and more interested now in the idea of uh, spaces of absences and what used to be, um, and the presence of absence in spite of the many, many efforts to cover it in so many layers of beautification and uh, covering. Um, yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Faridi? I can, am I audible? Yeah. Uh, so thanks for the question. Um, so much has already been said, but to sort of show my journey, I would like to build this connection between crisis, inscription, and ephemerality. Uh, we are, do understand that both crises and uh, the inscriptions that we're talking about in our papers are ephemeral. These are some sort of disjunctures, but they are of very different kinds. A crisis, at least in my case of the community art project in Kirti, it's a continuous everyday rupture. Every time you encounter the space as masculine, every time you encounter the space as empty of women visibly, even though they're going to work in this post-liberalization period, that crisis reoccurs, even when you forget it. So it's an everyday rupture. Now, inscriptions as a response to this rupture is a disjuncture in this masculine space. It's initiating a conversation. And they're both very, very feminine. However, in my paper, the response to the first form of rupture has been to delay the ephemerality of the other, to somehow protect it against human erosion because there is this idea of reaffirming belongingness to sort of continue the stake you've claimed for as long a period as you can therefore when a building is uh, when a mural is whitewashed the group feels sad the group feels that something a move that had, they had made forward they feel that they are being pushed two steps back so it's that delay in ephemerality 
um, that they want to protect it at least from uh, human factors of erosion. And that act of protection then becomes the way for them to resolve the crisis of not belonging and unbelonging. For young girls, it is an extension of taking claim to space and holding on to this temporary, uh, temporary the very temporary intervention that comes with street art and community art projects. In the past five years, uh, the group itself has go, go, uh, gone beyond uh, just street art in making this intervention in the public space. And uh, in a space like Khirki, which is an urban village and has not gentrified like other urban villages in Delhi, which have, uh, which have sort of turned into boutique spaces uh, visited by uh, upper class clients, you know, with these small shops. Khirki has not grown up to be that space. Khirki is still very much an accessible lower middle class space uh, with not the fullest of uh, public amenities. You know, so it's not gentrified in the same way. Uh, so in the five years, the space has not changed. But the way, uh, the first act of making the street art, what this group together gave them the confidence to stake the claim, that has changed. Um, when I was talking to the artist Sujata uh, of the Collective Review who initiated this process, uh, she said that now uh, these young girls who are primarily a part of the collective have started um, going out in the area at night, which is a huge thing for them who, were, who have felt so threatened, um, not, as, uh, not as space invaders just because of their gender, but some of them have also felt that because of a completely new country that they have come into, uh, because of instances of racism uh, that have happened to them or their families uh, and the lack of safety they have felt. For them to go out at night to bleed the to be the flan news as we academically call it. It's, it's a huge movement. So uh, that's how I see that in the fi uh, past five years, that's how the project has moved away from the community art project, but still foregrounded in that very mural attached to it. Uh, personally, uh, I am, uh, as a street art scholar, uh, I am much in the same direction as so many of others we've talked about. Uh, previous scholars have talked about um, the beautification of the city and that's also something that's happening uh, at a very good rate in uh, particularly the capital, where most of the street art that is visible in gentrified areas uh, is huge murals by artists. Uh, they are beautiful, of course, but often have no connection to the space. And there's this sort of just disjointedness. And now I want to look at what is this doing? What, uh, where in the street art chronology we are as a city, you know, like where, Primarily when we've looked at US, it's gone from tags to beautification. But what happens when a scholar begins from the chronology of beautification and possibly moves towards tagging, when, it, when this is inverse uh, in a highly effervescent environment now politically, uh, where a lot of political graffiti is also coming up. What happens when uh, in a third world country, in a third world country in quotes, when this chronology is reversed, that's why I'm a scholarly, like as an academic looking at it. Thank you. Thank you, Paridi. Oksana? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. And uh, I think the topic for next special issue might be uh, street art and graffiti in authoritarian city because uh, situation is not getting better in Russia when it's marching from authoritarianism to totalitarianism. So, and uh, I think uh, I would like to stress actually two points that the history of graffiti and street art and their presence in the city, it's really important because it's not only the images which are erased, but it's also the stories of their creators and public dialogue and many things attached to it, which are also erased from the city streets. And the other thing that I would like to mention that uh, counter narratives, like all these non uh, hegemonic narratives, could be in direct opposition. They 
can be like overtly uh, resisting to the present situation. But I think that it's also important to look at not that direct resistance because the very presence of the image could be considered as a resistance. And I would like to talk to the uh, imagery that we referred um, in our paper. So it's the image of the um, human face or just a face, which consists of like circle and a couple of spots in it. So, and it's like really difficult to interpret that. We see the face or we assume that it's the face, but we don't, do not know if it's a human face or it's just the face and what actually the expression of the face is. Is it sad? Is it uh, happy or just something? Or yeah, you can see the face. So, and uh, Moscow uh, streets were covered with these faces several years ago and people were just puzzled. They could not understand what it means, who are pictured and why. So, and I think that in uh, urban uh, spaces, we have right not just to understand and to identify the actors or the messages, but we also have right not to understand and to think what it actually means and to be puzzled in this way means to be involved in the dialogue, in urban dialogue, uh, being curious who did that, who created the image and what it means and how I should uh, react to that. And you can see, yeah, like some images uh, from uh, Moscow urban space that are quite direct, especially this one. So there's a uh, like definite message. So praising masculinity and militarism and stuff. And in contrast to that, this face actually involving and uh, troubling you, puzzling you, it's the, uh, the other way around that uh, suggests you, that includes you in the dialogue and uh, makes you think about the city, the publics and your role in the urban space. Thank you so much. Thank you, Oksana. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah. And coffee with technology. Yeah, it's all in comments. And um, I have Zoom insisting. Oh, unmute yourself. I'm, I don't want to unmute myself. Um, so and I think it's, um, there's a, I think, I think it was Liman Tsaffe who said that, that graffiti are the headlines of tomorrow's newspaper, stuff like that. So uh, that's given street art uh, is destined to follow what is happening anyway. And uh, we see, we, see, we witness this with, COVID-19 graffiti responses, and also, which also underlined the mere fact that in the hyper-technological uh, and saturated technological environments that we live in, still streets, this low-tech form of expression and community still matters. And um, at the same time, I think COVID also is, the COVID graffiti response is characteristic how different people enter the scene and for how many different purposes. Um, at least, I mean, everywhere, but also here uh, in Athens. And the other day, Maria Hadzidakis and I, I think Maria should be in the audience, and um, we were discussing, we were talking about how some street artists left the street scene and moved on. Um, uh, although um, their street production um, and having been made a name for themselves uh, with iconography which reflected uh, what we usually call as the economic crisis, which is fine, but of course it changed the, the scene and the, 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 
there by pornography as well. Now, in terms of intensity, but that's just my, my sense, I might be completely wrong. And uh, just to note here that I've been away for several years uh, from, from Athens, moving from one country to another. So it was a bit tricky for me to, to follow what was happening uh, exactly. But I felt that in terms of numbers, there has been a sort of drop that might be just, you know, uh, my sense. But in terms of urgency, uh, things are getting more mature. The talks are becoming more mature. If I can, you know, uh, I have uh, I don't have I think a better word to, to describe uh, the uh, the phenomenon. Uh, despite the quite, um, I mean, strong municipal attempts to introduce or promote a much more proper, normalized, not normalized would be, beautified graffiti image. So yes, we're open to supposedly to multiple voices and da da da, but of course this is not part of the case. And um, just to look with, with the piece that I was uh, writing, I was, it was trying the drawings, really, not the, the piece itself. The, uh, they were trying to capture and render visible this palimpsestic, if you like, writing, overwriting, erasing, uh, constantly in the making uh, nature of our surfaces and the and the uh, affinities they share. All these all these writings across different uh, epochs and and eras, and in a sense, it was creating sort of a, of a dialogue with, with Sarah's and Susan's methods on repeat photography uh, in just a completely different time scale, I guess, uh, which covers several, uh, several different decades and different crisis uh, moments. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's, that's in relation to how things might change and how we can capture these changes. Right. Thank you, Gustavine. And Julia, last but not least, your reflections. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep it short so that we have some time for the conversation with the audience. Of course, my work too is, is grounded in Athens. And it started not in 2017, as for most of us, when when this uh, when you know I presented this piece in Leeds, but actually in 2013. So I've had a project since 2013 called Aesthetics of Crisis that is documented and then thought about graffiti and street art in the context of the crisis. And in Athens, as most of you know, during this period and even before I started looking at it, um, Athens has really been considered one of the most saturated cities in Europe as these images portray very clearly, I think. Um, and there's been, and this is of course closely related to the abandonment of graffiti removal, both on part of kind of the municipality and on part of private business owners, which has is one of the one of the reasons why there's been such a proliferation. So crisis and austerity and graffiti and street art have in the context of Athens been super closely interlinked and associated in the way that uh, me and others have thought about it, even though we can problematize that, but let's just assume they've been associated. So if that has been true for most of the 2010s, then at the end of this decade with a new, with a governmental shift towards a new liberal conservative city government, there has actually been a really distinct shift to graffiti removal, negative curation, um, as an aspirational way of performing that the crisis is in fact over. And most of, I mean, all of those that, that have um, looked at graffiti and street art in Athens will know this very famous quote from Amalia Zeppu from all the way back in 2014, where she's basically like, if a city is in crisis, if it has collapsed, you'll have graffiti everywhere. But once graffiti becomes commissioned arts, it's a signal of a beginning to the end of the crisis. And so the current administration of Athens has almost completely taken this st statement and made it into a policy paradigm. They're fully embracing, as uh, Kostas mentioned, commissioned beautification-centric street art as a form of um, 
kind of amelior ameliorating the the kind of visual appearance of public space, whereas at the same time embracing the removal of what they call visual pollution and smudge of graffiti and uncommissioned street art as well from the city uh, to signal to uh, to the end of the crisis to a post crisis. And it's very interesting, I think, to look at what kinds of discourses they draw on to justify this and stage and frame this, because you can see a very kind of old school. I mean, first of all, it's really, of course, about the return of control to public space. Crisis and austerity are always a retreat of control from public space, and they are signaling a return in these campaigns. You always see um, you always see insistence that there is now a presence again of the municipality on the streets of the city, but they also draw on these very old school like moral panic discourses that we all know from really all the way back to New York City in the 70s of uh, graffiti as a quality of life offense, right? The mayor has spoken of graffiti removal as removing misery and uh, uh, kind of asserting the right to live in a city with clean public spaces. Those are all direct quotes from like social media posts by the mayor about these supposedly very successful re removal campaigns. Then there's also a more contemporary association with sanitation of public space in the context of COVID. So I think it's very interesting to think about how um, these discourses kind of morph with uh, new crisis situations and um, and really adjust to them. But of course, if we look on the ground, these graffiti removal campaigns are not very successful. They're in fact constantly failing. And in a city like Athens, I think we can argue that removing graffiti or negatively curating public space is, is kind of an impossible venture. But I don't think these campaigns are actually about making space free of graffiti, but they're about using graffiti as a vehicle to symbolically claim the end to crisis. So this is really where my attention has turned at the end of a decade almost of thinking about street art and graffiti in the context of crisis. But I want to thank everybody for all your kind of reports back on, on, the, on your respective situations. I was very moved and inspired by what all of you shared in the previous responses to this question. Thanks, Julia. Thank you. Um, so before we move to the, to the Q&A, I wanted to take this moment, because I saw some familiar faces, uh, to celebrate and also thank the queer feminist artists and crews. You know who you are. Um, because, I mean, in essence, they taught me everything I need to know about, about space, about community, and about writing. And I want to celebrate, you know, this queer feminist approach to graffiti and street art, because for me, it's almost, you know, graffiti and street art is almost like a gender identity. Whenever we arrive into a new city, you know, we, we other than following the inscriptions, there's always a friend of a friend of a crew. So it's, you know, this, this idea of like, understanding and, and you know viewing the city through through these eyes through this lens this opportunity for for you know the new placement and this playfulness um, is is part of you know my everyday life for like more than a decade now so thank you all you know who we are and also if there were to celebrate you know the, the fact that we do have strong queer feminist movements because without the movements we wouldn't be here talking about the inscriptions of those movements. So thank you all for that. And we got to you start the QA. Yeah. Um, so pop your questions in the chat if you don't want to speak them out loud, that's no problem. We can read them out. Um, otherwise please raise your hand um, or make a noise. Shake a spray can if you have one nearby. Um, while we're reflecting, um, I wanted to share a few images from the introduction of our special feature. Um, really um, reflecting on this question, what has changed? 
in the last uh, five years. I think in a way the introduction reflects on that in the context of the fortressing of so-called Europe um, and how the declaration of a crisis caused by people seeking asylum in Europe um, has really been fomented by the desire to uh, manage and uh, manage through torture the people seeking asylum um, in so-called Europe. That's really the, the juice of the introduction that we wrote and the fury that we see in uh, the walls, on the walls and against the walls um, in Athens over the last five years. So some images from that visual essay. And I would say if only graffiti were tomorrow's headlines, mm -hmm. that would be a nice world to wake up. <laughs> So any questions or comments or thoughts that you might have? I just want to talk about what you just said about we wish graffitis were tomorrow headlines. Uh, like in India, we had like in the past two years, of course, there was COVID, but there were two huge, huge people's movements that shook us and uh, transformed us in um, a multitude of ways. And I remember this incident uh, from the anti CAA protest um, where these beautiful graffitis had been created. Although the graffiti was not in headline, but the erasure was, and it was a huge deal to have whitewashed it. It was protesting that against the union government was trying to protect, and it was um, um, since they I'm sorry, I'm audible. Paridi, we lost you there for a second. Do you mind repeating the last couple of sentences? Uh, yeah, um, I was talking how even though the graffiti was in there, Oh no, Paridi, we've lost you entirely now. Okay. When Paridi reconnects, um, Hopefully, she'll be able to reconnect. Um, in the in the in, in the interim, um, I have um, asked you to not feel shy to put your questions or thoughts in the chat, and I'll be happy to read them out for you. Uh, Ulysses, I think you have uh, something to say. Yeah, I just had a question. So it was very interesting on the third the question, hearing the reflections in, there, in terms of the things that have changed uh, over the course of five years, but I'm curious about the methods and how your approach has changed over the last five years in terms of doing uh, or studying street art. Have the methods changed for you? Fantastic question. Um, Yuli, do you wanna take this one? Yeah, I'd love to start us off. I mean, I want to hear from from everybody. But for me, things have actually over the past uh, 10, almost or more than 10 years, really, of thinking about street art and graffiti, things have really shifted for me from thinking about street art and graffiti as an object of study towards thinking of street art and graffiti as a method of studying space more broadly. And I think um, I think that's echoed in, in a lot of uh, our contributions here, but to move away from object-centric approaches to site-specific approaches, and Susan's work has been uh, super influential here for me on, on, meth on the method of longitudinal photo documentation, um, which is 
essentially the kind of idea of, of not centering so much of, on a single snapshot of an object as the object of analysis. And I'm sure many of you know this piece, um, but, but kind of repeatedly returning to sites, returning to documenting them and thinking about you know, sequences and dialogues. And this is actually how I've come to think of my engagement with Athens, because I've been returning to the city since 2013. Every time I come, I continue to document, I continue to think about changes. So this is not super formalized, but that's kind of the broader kind of prism through which I now think about my own scholarship, having moved away from it as an object towards, uh, towards a methodological approach. And I'd love to hear what others have to say. Other thoughts on how methods have changed? That's a really interesting trajectory, Julia. I'm really happy to hear that. You've got such a great corpus of repeat photography of, of site. Uh, it's like, gosh, what's that, nine years? It's crazy. That's like, we're going to have to have a decade celebration of work. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think in terms of the involvement of my methods, I mean, I came to this originally as a trained conversation analyst. So I see dialogue in images and, and tried to find a way to capture what I was looking at that slowed the conversation down. So even though it's asynchronous, it, it, it still temporarily unfolds and responds in a lot of the same ways that, that other forms of dialogue do. You've just got to kind of string it all together to kind of re-embed it um yeah so i mean i'm still trying to figure out how to analyze the details of this because <laughs> there are some frustrating corners and also i've got massively involved in being like an, an academic midwife and an editor of two journals and you know all these stupid managerial not stupid wonderful managerial positions we kind of take on as we go higher and then you don't get to get be so obsessed with method like I really miss my PhD I really miss my postdoc um so the rest of you need to take this forward yeah I'm quite happy to read work <laughs> if I could add uh, a little bit also I think um uh, the methods have changed into um like looking from objects that exist and to hearing also stories of things that do not exist anymore um, and hearing again the, the the social life of what started in, in different narratives but um, I think my comment is more also on how those kinds of transitions um, do not only threaten um, um, active political activists on the ground but they also threaten journalists and academics doing any work on the topic and um, and to be totally honest, it has definitely discouraged me from uh, taking uh, more and more field work and interviews and um, and photo documentation in Egypt in a place where just carrying a camera could uh, get you into a lot of questions and a lot of problem. Um, so on, on again, a pessimistic note, I'm sorry about <laughs> all the pessimistic notes I have, but um, it has driven me to at least temporarily have the peace of mind of looking, um, using the same methodological framework I developed from that case um, and applying it on other cases. Uh, so I look in um, in um, right wing uh, political campaigning now and the process of othering through images. Um, I look at the the refugee crisis and dialogues uh, pro and againist um, also through image uh, posters and graffiti uh, about refugees in Denmark. So for me also it has changed a bit the primary place of data collection for me, uh, that uh, transition and political threat. A final insight, Buddy uh, Lee. Um, I just wanted to add to what Sarah just said, because I relate to it so much, uh, because I also study political graffiti, like feminist political movements primarily and cultural interventions in the city. And increasingly, as the researcher, the city becomes unsafe. As a gendered body of the researcher, the city becomes unsafe to you. Um, my methods have also transformed in now not carrying a digital camera, in making a case for grainy images. Uh, I'm currently working on my book project, and I, I, I would like to argue there that grainy image, like images, even though we live in this 
very, very developed world of beautiful images being created of amazing DSLRs. Not everyone has the privilege, not even like not financially, not have we do not have the ability to carry uh, big lenses, especially when we're going into active movements as women. So we have to understand, we have to make that case to use grainy images and be okay with that. And be being legitimate objects of research, very academically speaking. So um, methodologically, I think that's that's where I'm at, and that's that that's the line I would like to push. You know. Yes, thank you. Um, I can add a little bit more from my point of view as I was trained uh, from uh, anthropology. So like uh, from beginning of this, um, this project back to 2018, um, I started writing this paper from the point of view uh, of anthropologists. Um, but this recent year, uh, my interests have shifted more to ritual um, anthropology. So when, uh, and also the com community-based research. So uh, recently I um, in interested in using the, the method called uh, photo voice, which is um, um, asking the, the, the community to join in our research and, and uh, listen to their, um, that, their story. I found it, um, it's a fascinating tool, um, giving me an insight of the, the communities and like some story that uh, if I got, I'll collect it by my interview, I might not be heard about it. So that's, that's it for now, thank you. And if I may add, so, uh... I feel that my approach was also changed and it moved from a kind of isolated study of a particular city to the more comparative perspective. And I am really grateful to uh, Thailand and Egyptian case because it resembles Russian situation. And I think it's like really important not to self exoticize ourselves as we tend to do, like for example, study in Moscow, but to put things in broader context. And thank you so much for this discussion. It really inspires yeah, to continue our research. Thank you so much, all of you. Uh, we're gonna keep on trying to find ways to bring you all in Athens and maybe discuss about, you know, what we can do next. Bridging theory and practice. Bridging theory and practice for sure, but also we can find ways to leave our work out there on, on the walls, giving a new meaning to public scholarship. Hmm. It, was, it was really good to see everyone. Yeah, and nice thank you for being this group, I, I really needed the queer feminist graffiti scholarship group, so thank you. And thanks everybody for joining us um, and hopefully we'll um, do it again soon. Steve. Thank you so much. Take good care everybody. So, so much everyone. Have a lovely evening. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Wherever you are. Yeah, so global. <laughs> Many thanks. Thank you. Nice one. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Hey. Hi. Hello. Anna. Uh, I don't know if you know me, but I will be your intern uh, from September. So I only wanted to say hi. <laughs> me too, finally. I only spoke with uh, Penny. So uh, I don't know any of you, but yeah. very nice presentation. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to meeting you, Anna. Looking forward to meeting you in person. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. Bye.